Hello and welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. Thank you for clicking on this channel. I had uh, one or two inquiries in the last month about antenna performance, uh, mainly from newcomers. How do I check my antenna performance? How do I know it's working as well as it should? And what can I do? And what adjustments can I make? Well, it's a very broad topic and it's quite a challenging question actually how does my antenna work and uh, how can I check the performance so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the basics that you can do um, there's a lot of things you can do with antennas but if I cover the basics give you some idea of uh, what you can do and what you have to sort of leave to trust and uh, hope for the best well no not hope for the best but basically there are some things which are quite challenging <laughs> in order to check your antenna performance. So let's let's start at the beginning. Let's start with checking the power to the antenna because getting the power to the antenna is something that you can control and something that you should check out. So first of all, getting the power to the antenna. Now I think it's true to say that most uh, ham radio operators will use coax feed. I know there are some that don't, but basically, uh, uh, certainly, the, certainly newcomers will probably choose to use coax feed because it's the easiest way to get uh, power to the antenna and it's also the easiest system to use. Coax cable. Now, you can waste a lot of money on expensive coax cable if you're operating on the edge of bands. Why do I say that? Well, a lot of you will be operating from small gardens, so the coax run will be fairly short. And the loss on coax at the HF frequencies is surprisingly low. And in fact, even if you use something like RG58, the loss on, say, a 10 or 15 meter length of coax is very low indeed. And even when you get to the 10 meter band, 28 megahertz, you're only talking about a dB. Now, a dB is the lowest change in signal that the ear can perceive. And on HF, I would challenge anybody to detect a 1 dB change in signal level because the HF bands are not stable anyway. And it's almost impossible to perceive a 1 dB different chain, difference in signal strength on the HF bands unless you're operating on a silent band and you've got a fairly low signal level, say on 10 metres, the 10 metre band is closed and you're talking to a guy five miles away. But even then, I, did, I suspect that you couldn't tell the difference. So we can say that a 1 dB change in signal length, signal strength on the HF bands is neither here nor there. And in any case, all stations will suffer some loss and in fact this is where in a small garden you have an advantage because if you're a guy with two or three acres of ground and you've got a, 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 a coax run of 50 or 60 meters then you're going to lose some signal then you do, do need to upgrade your um, coax cable but even if you upgrade your coax cable on the HF bands you're still going to have a similar loss to the thinner cable because the difference between low loss cable and the sort of regular cable is very small indeed on the HF frequencies UHF VHF different matter I would suggest that if you're using coax cable and you've only got a 10 or 15 meter run and you're only running 100 watts then RG58 is not a bad choice. RG213 would be a better choice if you intend to increase your power and that might be prudent to do that if you're thinking of getting a linear because I wouldn't wouldn't recommend RG58 for anything over 100 watts even though it can take a bit more power. So RG213 is more than adequate for a small garden and it gives you leeway if you're going to add an amplifier at any time in the future. So let's look at the power transfer. You're going to have a radio that gives 10, 15, 20, uh, whatever the maximum power is. So the typical HF transceiver is 100 watts. Some of them give just a smidge over 100 watts 
and uh, you've got quite a lot of 10 watt rigs about and 5 watt rigs about. So basically you start off with a power level, let's say you start off with a power level of 100 watts on an HF transceiver. You've got an internal antenna tuner which you may choose to switch in uh, at times. My experience is that the loss on the internal ATU is of no significance whatsoever. It's a fraction of a dB, so we can, we can forget any loss on internal antenna tuners. You feed that power into your coax cable and you're going to get a loss of around about 1 dB typically in a small garden. Again, that is neither here nor there. And of course, as I said before, you have an advantage in a small garden because your power loss on your coax is going to be less than Joe Bloggs, who's got three or four acres of ground and has got to run 50 or 60 or even 100 metres of coax cable. So you have an advantage there. That power is then fed to your antenna. Now, if we have a wire antenna, say a dipole, or we have a G5RV, then all the power that you generate is going to go to that antenna. Some will be reflected, and here is an interesting um, topic, VSWR. You can get sort of you know, embroiled in a, in a sort of a, 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 a struggle over trying to get your VSWR down, and there's nothing wrong in getting the VSWR down. I mean, if you get to 1.5 to 1, you've probably got as far as you can go. If you can get 1.2 to 1, well, even better. But sometimes you can't get below 2 to 1. Now, if you have a 2 to 1 VSWR on your coax run, it's of no consequence at all. The difference between uh, the power delivered to your antenna with a 2 to 1 VSWR and a 1.5 to 1 VSWR is neither here nor there. And below this uh, video, I put a link to a table or a calculator, you can, you can calculate for yourself the losses on your coax run to your antenna. Now, please remember that if you switch in an antenna tuner and you then get a perfect match, that's only a perfect match as far as the transceiver is concerned. And it's quite important actually because a transceiver, as soon as it sees a VSWR crawling up to around about 2 to 1, it will start to throttle back to protect itself. And if you get above 2 to 1, you will get a power drop. So the amount of power delivered to your antenna is going to be far less than what it could be. If you switch the antenna tuner in, the transceiver is fooled into thinking there's a perfect match, and it's quite happy to deliver full power into your coax cable, even though the VSW on your coax cable remains unchanged at say 1.5 or 2 to 1. Remember, the only way to change VSW on your cable run is to uh, adjust your antenna. Some antennas you can get it down, some antennas you, you can't, you're, you're stuck with it. And of course, the bandwidth of an antenna also dictates VSWR. In the centre of the antenna, you may get a good match, but as you move to the edges of the band, the VSWR rises. Switch the antenna tuner in. The transceiver thinks it's got a good match. It's quite happy to deliver full power into a 2 to 1 VSWR, and the actual loss on that cable, a 2 to 1, is neither here nor there. So in a small garden, you haven't got that much loss on your coax cable, even though you may have a bit of VSWR on the cable run. Now, when we come to antennas, there's all sorts of antennas. We've talked about a dipole and we have a G5OV. Provided there's no traps in the uh, uh, antenna and it's a good length of wire, in other words, it's half wave or whatever, then the full power is delivered into that antenna. What about traps? Well, my experience of traps is that the loss is very small indeed. Again, um, the trap has been an essential part of many antenna systems, and I think it's generally accepted that any loss in the traps is, is very, very small indeed. What about verticals? Well, verticals is a slightly more sort of complicated matter. A vertical antenna, a ground-mounted vertical antenna has typically got a, a, an impedance around about 25 ohms, so you've got an a, a immediate mismatch. You've got feeding it with 50 ohm cable and you've got a 25 ohm uh, impedance. But there is also an earth loss there. 
Now, if you drive a copper stake into the ground, you've got a quite high earth loss, and probably you'll find that you get a very good match because the earth loss is in series with the impedance of the antenna, and it may give you a very good match. And it's a prime example, actually, where the low VSWR is not necessarily um, the best, or at least, at least it doesn't indicate that you've got a, a good match and you've got a very efficient antenna. If you add radials to the uh, um, vertical which of course is recommended then you tend to reduce the earth losses and so you've got more power into the antenna but with a vertical antenna you've always got that that sort of problem of getting the power into the antenna because there is a bit of an earth loss uh, one way to improve that of course is to raise the vertical off the ground by about a meter or one half meters and use tune radials but by and large uh, if you've got radials um, on the ground, then you're going to get um, a reasonable amount of power into the vertical antenna. So these are checks you can actually do yourself. You can measure the VSWR, you can get it down, you can make sure you've got uh, a decent bit of coax cable, make sure the connections are okay. It's always good engineering to make sure those plugs are put on properly. Um, because they may be okay in the warm weather, but as, as they weather over the winter and so forth, the water gets in. So make sure that you waterproof your plugs. Um, you, you can either use amalgamating tape. Actually, what I have done, I have found that, you, that uh, um, cling film is very good. Um, I've had some cling film out in the garden now for about six months, and it's weathered over the, over the winter, and it's quite a good way of uh, uh, weatherproofing all sorts of uh, connections outside. So give it a try, it's, it's cheap and easy and it's very easy to replace, of course. Now, how effective is your antenna? How is it performing? That's a big question that a lot of uh, you have asked. It's not an easy question to answer, or at least it's not an easy uh, way to come up with any positive uh, results. Uh, there's, let, me, let me explain. Basically, you can model an antenna, and uh, you can use there's various software modeling things, and you you know everyone thinks how clever you are because you've come up with these modeling um, figures and uh, and the polar diagrams and so forth, and they, the, the the software is very good, but the downside of it is it doesn't actually tell you the truth for the antenna in your particular location. And as I said before, if you have a vertical in the middle of a field um, with nothing around for about um, uh, 50 or 100 meters, then maybe uh, you're getting a good idea of the di polar diagram of the antenna and uh, where the signal is pointing, etc., the angle of, angle of uh, radiation and so forth. Um, particularly relevant for verticals where they are affected um, quite a lot by surrounding terrain. And to some extent also any horizontal antenna is going to be affected by the location. And if you're a sort of typical ham radio operator operating from a small garden, then what the modelling uh, tells you is basically what the antenna is capable of, but it doesn't tell you what the antenna is actually doing in your particular garden because it's surrounded by houses, concrete, roads, uh, telegraph poles, trees, shrubs, all sorts of things. And it's it's affected by... Um, objects which are several wavelengths away from the antenna. So basically it's a bit of a problem but the modelling will actually tell you what it could do unfortunately it doesn't tell you what it is doing. So how do you actually um, find out how effective your antenna is? Well unfortunately there isn't an easy answer. You can use reverse beacon network, you can use FT8 which will give you reports um, and there's various other, other um, modes which will give you reports of your signal at, at a particular time. But unfortunately, it doesn't actually give you an A-B test. For example, if you put your antenna up um, by 10 foot um, and you want to see what the difference is, unfortunately, you can't do it because the vagaries of uh, uh, HF communication are such that conditions are varying almost second by second and certainly minute by minute and certainly over a longer period of time. So you can't do an A-B test. Interestingly enough, back in the, uh, well, the earlier days, back in the 50s and 60s, um, and particularly in, in America, they had antenna ranges where you could actually install an antenna and then have a sensor some way away from the antenna, say some way away, I'm talking about several wavelengths away, 
and you could actually carry out tests on the antenna and see what effect it uh, had um, on the radiation pattern of the antenna etc. Um, unfortunately we don't have that uh, <laughs> that facility so um, it's it's almost impossible to do an AB test on an HF antenna because the um, uh, the propagation on the shortwave bands is never stable and you know it's very easy to be fooled let me explain we're going through a period now of sunspot uh, climbing and doing quite well and we've got conditions on 12 and 10 meters where we're really good and I think if you're a fairly newly licensed amateur, you're amazed at what you can do on those bands. You know, you can work Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, the, the Far East, etc., etc. And I think some, some are quite amazed at what they can do. This has all happened before. Um, the, the previous Sunspot Peak was not very good, but in the earlier ones, um, the conditions were exceptional. So working um, these uh, far off places and getting good signal reports is nothing new but it is new to those that are new to the hobby. Um, now, it's that sort of thing that can fool you. You make an alteration to an antenna and you think, gracious me, I, I'm now working in New Zealand, Australia, and I'm getting five, seven, five, eight. Um, it's great. Well, of course, it's partly and probably mainly due to the, uh, the, the sunspot cycle and how, how well it seems to be performing at the moment. It's rather akin. I, I, you know, if if you if you if you purchase a new antenna, um, you want to kid yourself that it's working, don't you? And then I, I can remember back in the days of hi-fi, people buying gold-plated plugs and all sorts of things, and conv convincing themselves they could hear the difference. I'm not sure they could, but anyway, you you can actually psych yourself up into thinking things are better because you've spent some money on the antenna, etc., etc., um, or because you've made alterations. So basically. It's not really possible to do an A-B test. Over a longer period of time, you may come to a conclusion. But of course, even over a longer period of time, it's very difficult because conditions are improving. Um, it's probably easier to, to make assessments on the lower frequency bands um, where uh, the conditions are sort of less um, affected by the, by the sort of daily sunspot cycle. But there is no easy way. All you can do is to... Um, follow good practice, um, get your if it's a horizontal antenna, get your antenna up as high as possible. Uh, if it's a vertical antenna, make sure you've got decent radials, try and get it off the ground if possible. And that's really all you can do. There is no way you can do an A-B test um, on, uh, on, on an antenna because it takes a period of time to make the adjustments. Um, probably one of the easiest things to do is to, to see the direction of a Yagi. But, there again, if you've got a small garden, you're, you're probably down to wire antennas. So that really is all that uh, you, you, you can do. Um, it's all part of the fun, isn't it? Um, experimenting, but you never know, particularly with antennas, experimenting, but you never know whether you've actually achieved anything other than being able to read the VSWR, etc., etc. As far as propagation and the effective radiation pattern of the antenna, it's very difficult to measure. But the modelling will give you a guide. Unfortunately, the local buildings and all the trees and all the shrubs and all the telegraph poles and all the wires and the local house wire next door will distort it and uh, it won't give you um, a very good answer. But there we are, that's, uh, that's the situation. So, rambled on a bit. I hope it's given you some information and whatever happens, enjoy ham radio because conditions are getting better and better. And no matter what your antenna is doing or capable of, it's probably capable of more in the coming months than it was a few months ago. And that's good news. Thank you for watching this channel. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support down at Portsmouth and, our, and, and through our website and so forth. And as usual, oh, by the way, I shall be off um, in Scotland uh, next week. So uh, no videos uh, next week, but uh, well, it depends when I publish this one. Anyway, look forward to seeing you in the next video, whenever it comes up. Take care. Bye for now.